You came back. You didn't have to, you know. Nope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is all optional. So thank you for coming back. Did everyone, I know we have some new arrivals. Did everyone, does everyone have one of these? And if you don't, there's a box at each back corner or I can throw you one um, if you're feeling dangerous. So make sure you have one of these. There's one for everyone that attends uh, this week. And if you um, want more copies to take back to your field or your small group or your church or whatever, um, uh, they're ten dollars a piece, and you can just uh, write a check to Run Hard, Rest Well. Um, they are twelve ninety nine on Amazon, so you can buy them there as well and have them shipped if you'd rather do that. Uh, they're just a little more expensive. There's also I just found out there's a Kindle version. Um, you wouldn't be able to write in it, but you can have uh, if you're into that. I think those are also ten dollars, so you can have print for ten. Or and I brought plenty hopefully so if anybody wants uh, something to take this back again the purpose of this retreat is to give a taste of some of this and then um, the real work of rest happens um, back in your life because it's it's easy to consider these things here or easier right because you're not in it you're not on the field you're not in your home, you're not in your world. Um, you've stepped out of traffic. We've gone to Huntington, where there's nothing to do and no place to go, and um, so it's e it's a little easier. Somebody is watching your kids, right? And you may not have that on a daily basis, and that's a uh, certainly a, a distraction from some of these things and makes it uh, difficult to have some of these rhythms. So, the work of this, if you commit to working on this and, and discovering God's gifts of these rhythms of rest is going to happen after this retreat in the next months and years, um, hopefully, that you're on this journey. So uh, that's the purpose of this book. We'll look at a few things in it today and tomorrow, and then, um, and then it'll be yours to go through uh, slowly if that's your pace. Uh, before we begin today, uh, I heard um, great questions yesterday after the session and also some great um, comments about your service last night. Um, before I start with some things that I have on my heart, does anyone just feel uh, like they would want to share something uh, with this group, what God is maybe showing you or um, an aha moment that you had yesterday um, during either session, uh, the one with Dan and uh, some of the things that were done there. I've, I've just heard excellent things that God is working and moving, and I, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to share uh, some of that out loud if you are feeling something's burning within you, uh, like the prophet and the uh, I have to share this. Is there anyone this morning that just wants to give a brief word of testimony? As dangerous as that is. This is what we call wait time in education. I'm okay with silence. That quote, by the way, I think was from the Praying Life book, and that went fast. I should have ordered more of those, but um, I was told that by John that you have, if you want to um, order that, since we're out of those today, um, and have it, I would highly recommend it. Um, 
that you can, you have two options. One is to use your ministry account to order that book and have it um, for you. And also the other option was uh, for the board to pay for it, which is gonna take um, two board meeting readings um, <laughs> to get that approved. So um, if you wanna wait about a year, um, that's your other option. Uh, so. You do have those available. <laughs> am, I, am I about right on that, Dan? Is that the... Okay, all right. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got that right. So, um, but I would, I would highly recommend uh, that book. Um, thank you for that. appreciate that. Okay, well, uh, let's dive in. Um, it seemed like I had one other thing. Oh, did... Did you receive, I was talking with Brenda last night on the phone driving home after my other conference and uh, just telling her how things went. She wondered and has been praying for you and praying for this time. And she wondered if you had an opportunity to fill out the little survey that I, I emailed kind of in a response. Um, and what she does with that, I'm learning more about this. Um, there's some follow-up that, that she likes to do um, six months from now, a year from now, um, and at, you know, how can we support you in this? Um, there's also, um, let me just show you while I'm thinking about it, because I will forget if I don't. Let me show you. There is a, um, a website that I would recommend, and maybe you've already um, gone there. Uh, let's see if my computer is connected. Yes, um, but it's not showing on the screen. There we go. Nope, almost. Um, come on, there we go. So here is the Run Hard Rest Well website. Try saying that um, with just the picture. You know, if you just need that, um, is awesome but it's information. The one that I would encourage you to check out is the blog. If you sign up for this every Wednesday morning, you'll get an email um, that will give um, just a one page or less. Uh, it's, I think, I can't remember how many words. It's like 500 words or less, something like that. Just a short thought to continue to nudge us towards these rhythms. Um, and so, you can see all the ones she's written in the past, and she has other authors. I've written a couple, um, but if you go past, you can see um, these different thoughts and ideas, and it's just a great resource. Um, it's also, um, if you're interested in hosting retreats or doing more with this, all of that information is here. So we're not selling anything, we're just providing support if you um, wanna be a part of this network. So runhardrestwell.com, I would encourage you to go to the blog and um, sign up for those emails. And then you'll be, and you may already be, if you fill out the survey, you may be part of um, something anyway. So I'm not sure how all that works. Um, but it's, a, it's just nice. It's a good, good resource. All right, enough about that. What I want to do today is spend a lot of time in Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, I'll be, I'll be showing most of the Scripture on the screen. But some of it is uh, in the message again. And so if you want a real Bible version, um, you can use your own. Um, my pastor used to say, you know, if, uh, King James was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me, and so, um, so we uh, looked at that version growing up. So the four rhythms of rest, yesterday was all foundational, and some of you are wondering what are the, the rhythms of rest, if you haven't read ahead in your book, um, these are them. And my plan is to go through and just introduce the first two today, sleep and Sabbath. 
And then tomorrow we'll look at stillness and solitude. And I'm actually planning on giving you some opportunities uh, during the sessions tomorrow, if we have time, and we should, um, to experience some of these. I'll also give you some handouts that may guide you through those. So if, um, you know what I could do, I'll give those to you today so that you don't miss the Family Olympics tomorrow. But if you want to use some of that, by design, some of that afternoon um, time during this week has been for, um, for you to experience some of this and to really retreat and be alone if that is what fills you up. And, uh, you, you know, there's opportunities to do that here and beautiful today. Uh, it's going to be sunnier as, as the clouds move out. And so I think the rain is ending. So today will be a good opportunity to get outside and just enjoy some of the green and some of the blue that um, is around us and uh, God uses, I think, put those things in our lives to help us. Um, some of the work, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but some of the work that Brenda has done is uh, in psychology and looking at depression. And they've done studies where in um, uh, treatment facilities where people are being treated for uh, depression, uh, they have um, had a control group and an experimental group where they asked, you know, they said, here's the traditional treatment, you know, indoors and all of that. But if the rest of you um, would, tr would try this experiment and uh, for 10 minutes a day be outside and um, in nature and that the um, healing rate or time was cut in half if just for 10 minutes a day, they spent some time in green space, uh, in the yard, under a tree, um, that the depression um, and their treatment time was cut in half. If they spent any of that time, that 10 minutes near water, it was cut in half again um, by a stream, by a lake, a pond, the ocean, um, it's really remarkable. And especially when you consider, um, Psalm 23, um, God knew this. And I think there's something in our design. There's something in our nature and our spirit that craves that green and blue space. And so I would encourage you. And by the way, um, the research that they've done on um, people that live over 100, it's, it's in those Mediterranean environments or it's um, spaces where they're near water and they're near um, nature. And so if you spend a lot of your day in concrete and glass, um, I would encourage you to get out of there <laughs> on occasion. Eat lunch outside, be, be outside, take walks. Um, I took a walk last night um, after the rain stopped in Ligonier, and uh, it was just refreshing to my soul just to take a walk alone and back in our neighborhood and um, be out there and breathe and um, be alone with God in His sanctuary. And um, so that was a that was free. That didn't cost anything. Okay, the first rhythm of rest is sleep. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And if you struggle with sleep, you know uh, how difficult that is. Um, and many, many do um, struggle to get uh, rejuvenating sleep and good sleep. And there's a lot of, we'll look in the, in the book here in a minute at some practical suggestions um, of what we can do to have better sleep. And a lot of that was put together by a medical um, doctor that's on the team for this uh, organization and how can we uh, get better sleep. So we'll get into the practical here in a minute, but I want to look at scripture. And so we're going to be in Genesis 1, my favorite chapter in the Bible. And I think there's so much in here that is excellent. Here is where God put his first rhythms down. This was his design. This is um, good and perfect. 
And what I love about Genesis chapter 1 is uh, the rhythms that God uses as he created. Uh, someone asked, I, I enjoy the, the creation evolution conversation, and someone asked me one time, um, do you really believe that God created this world in six days? Um, how could he have done all of this that fast? <laughs> and my question was, why did he take so long? Um, if you're speaking and things are appearing, why spread it out? Why not just let it be all there? Why did he use, my, my opinion, my belief, six 24-hour days? Why did he spread it out that long? Did he really need the entire day to create all the animals and, and mankind on day six? Did he really need... You know, that entire day, was it mostly the morning? You know, I, we don't know what that day looked like. Um, but we do know from Scripture, if we believe it's God's uh, word, and I do, that there was a pattern to it. There were some rhythms. There were some things that he did again and again. And so we see that in the nature of God, this idea of rhythm. And that's what somebody, somebody said yesterday, um, I think in member care, I don't remember who it was, was sharing me that they're, we're, they're using in this organization, WGM, more the word rhythm instead of balance. You know, and we were talking about trying to balance all these things in my life. And we're really, um, I was told, trying to move towards the word rhythm. So this fits really well with that. God uses rhythms for some reason. Um, and, and so... When we try to fight against those rhythms, that's when I think we, we have trouble in this life. So we see in Genesis 1, um, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but in verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness night. There's so much in here, I would love to spend all day on this, but I'm not going to. And there was evening and morning the first day. What strikes you about that last phrase, that last sentence? Is that the way we talk about a day? When did today start? This morning. When did it start for the Hebrews? Last night. When, what time? Six o'clock, right? So what is today? Wednesday? Wednesday started... Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, and goes until tonight, tonight at 6 o'clock. Why do you think? It begins with sleep. It begins with sleep, and we touched on this a little bit yesterday. I believe this is God's design, and you see it in every day. Um, there was evening, and there was morning. We start, God put in to creation my interpretation of this, a beginning with rest. Let's start with you people that I've created going unconscious for six, seven, eight hours and letting me work and be the instigator. Let me be the protagonist. I am God. And then you respond to me in the morning when I give you my new mercies each day with your response. How are you going to respond to the work that I'm doing already behind the scenes in your life, in your world? Let's begin our day in the evening. For my wife and I, this happened pretty early on in our marriage. Uh, we were uh, fresh out of college. We were, you know, no kids. And Friday and Saturday nights, you know, teenagers, early 20s. Uh, it was date nights. It was movies, uh, staying up late. So we, you know, our Friday nights and Saturday nights would look like that. And we started noticing that our Sunday mornings, we were pretty exhausted. And as exciting as our pastor was, Hubert Harriman, um, <laughs> we found it difficult to stay awake and pay attention and give God our best on Sunday morning. And so we determined that Saturday night was going, we were going to start preparing, especially as we started having kids, that Saturday night was going to be the night that we get to bed at a decent time 
that we begin preparing our hearts and minds for what was our Sabbath, Sunday. Um, and it, it helped us so much. Uh, we were ready for Sunday morning. Um, the Sunday morning rush was less um, chaotic. Um, and if you have, you know, you remember those days with kids, maybe they still are that way. Um, you know, the guy in the car honking the horn and, the, you know, all of those stereotypes. Um, we had much less of that and we were ready to worship. We were ready to fellowship. Um, we didn't have to pre pretend that we had it all together. <laughs> we, we, um, you know, <clears throat> like we had been fighting in the car and then we smile at everybody in church. Um, it was more authentic and we began to see the day, the next day, the preparation for the next day begins in the evening. And the later we got to bed and the, and the more scattered we were the night before, the more trouble we had that next day. And I think that's true for just about every day of the week. Um, your preparation for tomorrow will begin tonight. And a lot of how tomorrow goes Will, begin, will be determined by how this evening goes. So I think there's something to this rhythm um, that God established in the beginning. And if we can begin to shift our mind to Thursday begins tonight, and I'm going to begin preparing my mind and my heart and seeking the Lord tonight to say, God, what, is to, what do you have for me tomorrow? Help prepare my mind so I don't miss you tomorrow and the things that you have for me. And I'm going to rest, and I'm going to give the things that are on my heart and mind, the burdens that I'm carrying, I'm going to give those to you, and then I'm going to go to sleep, and I'm going to rest well tonight. We're much better when we're rested. I'm a better father when I've had a good night's sleep. I'm a better husband. I'm a better leader in the roles that I have when I have had sleep. I am not what God intended for me to be when I'm not well rested. And I know that there's seasons in life where when there's new babies, you're not going to be well rested. Um, some of the dumbest things that I've ever said to my wife happened in the middle of the night when it was the third time up and I'm pretending to be asleep and uh, the baby's crying and um, it's... It's not how we were designed, <laughs> but I understand that that's a season. And um, sleep, I know for me, sleep heals me. When I, when I get sick, I need sleep more than I need anything else. Um, and we know this. Any questions or comments before I... I'm going to... We'll, we'll look at sleep here in just a second, but I just wanted you to see it's in every... Um, passage here in Genesis 1, um, evening and morning, evening and morning. And I see this thread throughout scripture, by the way. And if you look for it, if you start doing a study, if you ever want to do, if you do topical studies, maybe as you read through the Bible and you highlight certain themes, begin looking for themes of rest and you'll see them. It's everywhere um, as, we, as you get into God's word. Let's look at into the workbook on page 45. This is kind of in the middle of the section or maybe towards the end of the section on sleep. And I don't want to spoil everything, but I want you to just see some practical tools in here. This is um, the definition of sanity. The de definition of insanity is doing what you've always done but expecting different results. And she's talking about cortisol and the, the stress hormone that we need some of. Um, it gets us up in the morning. It helps us respond to danger or different situations. But if it's always heightened, there's tremendous uh, negative physical effects of this. And so a lot of this um, uh, chapter on sleep uh, deals with cortisol. But down at the bottom of page 45, she gives some... Um, suggestions that have so solid science behind them that play a role in enhancing our body's ability to pump out calming hormones and slow down the outpouring of cortisol and adrenaline. 
And so these are just some practical steps. If you're struggling with sleep or if sleep is not something that comes easily for you and your mind is constantly running um, in the evenings or at night, or maybe you get to sleep and then you wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. And so you're never feeling physically rested and you're not able to enjoy um, God's gift of sleep. Here are some things. There's three lists that she puts together on 45, 46, and 47 um, that are things to do uh, or try that may help you experience this gift better. Number three, drink all the caffeine you want before 1 p.m. Let your body um, begin to come down from that enhancement. One of the biggest sleep robbers that our generation or our culture is facing is the screen. And they're doing a lot of studies right now that um, basically are coming back to the screens have no place in our bedrooms um, for multiple reasons. Um, and sleep is, a, sleep is a big one there. And so if what, it, what you're doing, what you're watching, what you're... Um, you know, even the colors and the brightness and the lights are not allowing our minds to settle down before bed. And so we recommend reading. We recommend um, times of prayer um, instead of, so those last 30, 40 minutes before bed, that those are non-screen times, that the phones and the um, TVs and all of that stay out of the bedroom, um, especially if sleep has been an issue. Um, and that's just dealing with the issue of sleep. There's multiple other issues that go along with that that I won't get into today, but um, that's one major rec recommendation. Anything that stands out to you from this list? This is just it's kind of more nuts and bolts, um, but I think we're, we're missing out if we're not, um, we're missing out on God's best if we're not able to experience good periods of sleep. Your body is doing tremendous healing work during sleep. That is crucial time for us. That's when our day begins, is when we sleep. And it's a, just a gentle mind shift. This is not, uh, you know, that this is unproductive time. This may be some of your most productive time. And when you're well rested, you know, you're a different person. You're more fun to be around. When you're not well rested, you're not fun to be around. I'm not, and I'm just assuming that about, about you as well. Nate, yes? I'd also like to add that this is an area that I think the enemy freely pursues us yes. to disrupt our sleep, and we need to not ignore the spiritual warfare element in that, and um, it has helped us um, to sleep better when we pray specifically over our sleep before we get sleep. Praying specifically for good sleep, knowing that that's the time that God is at work in our hearts and our minds, literally, and um, restoring us. And so praying for that sleep and praying. We pray around our house, praying that God's spirit would be the only spirit that can have influence through the night. And that has helped us tremendously, especially in Uganda, um, because we have trouble sleeping in the city with the lights and the noise and the heat and all those things, and so just praying that that won't give any footholds to the enemies has made a big difference for us. Good, good, excellent. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, let's move on. Sabbath. Relational restoration. These first two are laid down in the first two chapters of the Bible and God's plan. The heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Because he was tired? Why did he do that? Set an example, I think. Any other reasons? Any other possibilities? 
Certainly we know he didn't need it. God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He doesn't rest. It doesn't mean it's a design flaw for us. He designed us to rest. He designed us, and so he's showing us a pattern. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Did you ever consider that this is the first thing that God made holy? It's not the temple. It's not us. It's not anything in his creation other than this day. This is the first thing that he says, this is holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. It's different. It should be special. It should be anointed. It's, it's not common. The other six days are common. These are my normal days, whatever that looks like for you. You may say, I've never had a normal day in my life. I don't know what that even looks like. This is an uncommon day. This is... Uh, set apart, holy unto God. I think we've lost some of that. The Israelites certainly did. Have you ever, I, I'm working my way slowly through the Old Testament right now, and I just started wondering, what is it that God seems to really get upset about with his people? And I, I've noticed a pattern. There's two things that seems like really gets God good and angry. One is when they neglect his Sabbath. Not just the Sunday Sabbath, but all of them. The other one is when they neglect the poor and the widow and the orphan, and the stranger and the alien among them. I, th I see that pattern throughout history. This is what God really seems to get fired up over. There are other things idols, you know, all of that. But it seems like these two things, I've noticed a pattern. Why so much emphasis on the Sabbath? Why is that so important to God? Does he have low ego or self-esteem and he just needs a bunch of people to come together in big buildings and sing praises like we heard this morning and last night to him because his, you know, he needs his ego stroked? He doesn't, he doesn't need our praise. He doesn't need that. He does, I think he enjoys it. I think we can bless God. Certainly, we see that throughout Scripture. But he knows that, that we need this. This is an opportunity for us to spend extended time with him, just like we need in our relationships, in our friendships, in our marriages. Uh, I gave the example yesterday of the communication that I had with my wife. By the way, we, um, the dog never got on the couch again, so rest, <laughs> rest your mind at that. Um, um, we need some extended time together. If all we ever have are those, those brief daily interactions, you know, and, and all you ever have is um, you know, a few minutes at the beginning of the day and a few minutes at the end of the day and maybe praying at meal times where you're interacting intentionally with God, um, you're going to miss a big part of that relationship. And he knows that we need that. We need to connect um, on a regular rhythm of connection with him. We also need rest. We need an extended rest from our work, extended rest from our labor. Let's look at some of these other passages on the Sabbath day. This is... Five different, these are five different versions of the command to set aside a day. What do you notice? What stands out to you? What word or phrase stands out to you in all of these versions? Okay, six days work, seven days stop. Now, what if you're a pastor? What if you're a missionary? Yeah, it may not be on Sunday, right? In fact, um, that may be your busiest day. What we found with our pastor is he was having um, a day off, you know, like we, um, most people get, like a Saturday, and then a Sabbath. Um, it's kind of the tradition in America. And so we had, he was really getting dry and feeling burnout and struggling with some things. Um, and we said, what, when is your Sabbath? 
And he said, well, my day off is, you know, I take a day off on Saturday. I said, no, 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 when is your Sabbath? When are you and God together? And when are you and your family together enjoying this day and resting from your normal labors? And he said, I am not, I don't do this. So we determined as a church, we were going, our pastor was going to have uh, a day off and a Sabbath and that we were going to know when his Sabbath was and we were going to shield him from his normal work on that visiting, calling, whatever it is. This is your Sabbath and we expect you to be spending this time Sabbathing because pastors sometimes are the worst at it. Missionaries may be the worst at it too or second, second in line, worst at Sabbathing because we don't know how to do this. Um, we don't know what this looks like, I don't think. Um, we certainly don't in, in the laity, but um, we just kind of assume, well, you know, pastors is Sunday. That's not a rest day for them. That's a very busy day. A lot of them are teaching Sunday school or leading prayer meetings, um, preaching, leading the service. It's not a restful day. Having people into their home, going into other people's homes, leading small groups. It's not a restful day. What else do you notice? Who benefits when I Sabbath? Everyone. Everyone. What else? Be refreshed. Be refreshed. If you're not being refreshed, then are you Sabbathing? Well, do you feel refreshed? when you have spent time with God or with family or enjoying time away from your normal labors. If, if you don't, I would encourage you to look at how that day is spent, how that time is spent. Um, I was working with a pastor on this concept um, a little while ago, and he decided that his Sabbath was going to be Friday. He, he was looking at this Hebrew idea of evening and morning. And he said, we're going to Sabbath and we're going to shut off our phones Friday evening until Saturday evening. Because he said, Saturday evening, I, you know, I'm getting ready for my message, getting ready for the next morning. I go into the church, run through my message. And so that's a, that's a busy time for me. Of course, Sunday is completely busy, but our Sabbath rest for our family and time where I can be alone with my wife and my kids and my God is going to be from Friday evening to Saturday evening. And they let their church know. And they guarded, they protected that time. They had a few numbers that were emergency numbers where people could contact them. But other than that, they set that time aside and, um, and found made time for Sabbath rest. And he, he said it's been life-changing for him. He had been in the ministry 10 years and had never really experienced this type of Sabbath rest. His family benefits, his pets benefit, right? Your animals benefit. Rest each day, each once, one day each week for, from your ordinary labor. This was the passage that was transformative for me when I began this study. Isaiah 58. And I was sharing a little bit yesterday about my idea of Sabbath. It was basically a, thing, a list of things that we didn't do. And mostly based on the tradition of my family or tradition of our church. I want you to read this and tell me what this speaks to you. What do you notice that maybe you haven't seen before about Sabbath? Twice it mentions uh, doing as you please in verse 13. And that is um, 
rather than doing what God has commanded and what God wants. And so we're told not to just do as we please, but to follow God's pattern. And we'll find our joy in the Lord, and He will cause us. Okay. All right. What else? Just piggybacking on that, it, it makes it a choice whether we, uh, whether we celebrate a Sabbath or not. And so many people feel like, I really don't have a choice. The pressures of life don't give me a choice. But this would say otherwise, you know, and following the pressures is doing what I please. I, I feel I must do that, so I'm choosing. Yeah. Good. What else? To me, I like that it, if we call the Sabbath a delight, he's going to give us a choice. And, it, you know, it kind of goes along with the Psalms, too, where it talks about delighting yourself in the Lord. Yeah. That's the piece I was missing all these years. Um, the Sabbath was not a delight to me. I, I felt like... Um, there were a lot of things that I was supposed to do, and there were a lot of things that I was not supposed to do. And um, I was not finding my joy in the Lord on the Sabbath. And so I began to pray, Lord, help me find joy on this day. What is it that is going to um, strengthen my relationship with you? What, what things should I be doing? What things should I be filling my mind and heart with um, on this day that will bring me joy and that will bring us joy in our relationship together? And it has transformed this day for me. Um, I determined um, early on, when I, especially when I transitioned um, to this job at Indiana Wesleyan, there's a lot of pressure with online learning, um, most of our students are doing a lot of work on the weekends. And so there's a lot of emails coming in, a lot of questions to be asked. Um, and, and frankly, Sunday is a big day where working adults are getting their master's education uh, classes in. And so, and we've talked about this at the university, um, what do we do to um, kind of mitigate that? Because there's a lot of pressure to respond to those emails. You know, you see an email in there and they're stacking up and, you know, they're kind of freaking out. I don't know what to do about this. And, um, and I just determined early on that Sunday, I would just let my students know. I'll, I'll work probably till, um, you know, I'll check things Saturday night if, uh, if you have questions. But if you send me an email on Sunday, I'm not going to respond to it until Monday morning. I'll respond first thing Monday morning, but I'm going to set this day aside. I have to shut it off. The problem from work with working at home is you never, go to, you never go to work. That's the nice thing, but you never come home either. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the hard part. It's always there. And so I determined that I have to, for my family's sake, for my marriage's sake, for my relationship with God's sake, I have to shut it off. I have to lay this down. And I'm going to spend this day reading books that edify my soul, taking a bike ride. That's something that gets me into God's sanctuary. I talk almost the entire time with God as I ride. It's time for me to be away from technology and just enjoy that time. I play soccer with my boys, um, take a nap. Uh, usually I just need a short little nap. But my Sunday has been transformed because I'm looking for opportunities to experience delight and joy in my maker instead of all the things that I can't do or all the things that I should be doing on that day. And um, so I would encourage you, and we'll, we'll take a look at that here um, in just a minute. I'm going to give you, we'll take a break and I'll give you some time to consider some of this. Is there anything else that stands out to you in anything that I've said? How many of you have duties? Um, let's, who would like to pray? It's 10.02. We'll pray for our, pray that the Lord send harvest workers into his harvest field. Is there somebody that would like to lead us in prayer for that right now? Thank you, John.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can rest. And we pray for uh, those around the world right now, God, that uh, they would just hear your call to go out. And God, as they are resting in you, would they go forward in you? your strength, knowing that you'll provide the resources, you'll answer questions, you'll you'll be with them the entire way and they will be with you. So God, we pray for a mighty movement of your spirit in each of our hearts and the people we know and those we haven't met yet. We continue to raise up workers, God, to go out. We love you, we praise you. Thank you. Let's do this. Um, let's take a break, and I want you, if you have your Bibles, hopefully you do. Does everyone have a Bible? Um, bring, or an app, Bible app, at least, right? We have all got that. It's our backup, backup dagger. If you don't have your sword, at least you got something, right? Um, I would like us to take the next, let's take a half an hour. It's nice out. I would encourage you to go outside. And as you um, consider these things, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you two handouts right now. You don't have to. And I feel more at rest and more rested. And my kids know this is the day that dad's not gonna be in front of his computer. And they look forward to this day. I look forward to this day. I, I, you know, you should shut your computer down occasionally. Uh, it needs that. It needs to put things away. It needs a rhythm. And so Saturday night, I, I look forward to that moment where I say, all right, I'm shutting it down. And everybody in my family knows I'm not going to be on that thing doing work till Monday. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing that I can do uh, that makes me just look forward to this day when um, I didn't previously. I didn't really look forward to this time um, because it really wasn't a day of rest. It was just another day. It was another ordinary day. It was not holy. It was not set apart in my life. And I didn't enjoy it. And God has been using this as I'm just slowly discovering these things to help me. Okay, now that we have, I think, most of us back in here, um, would anyone like to share something that they read? It's interesting uh, looking again through that passage in Ezekiel. It's not really about the Sabbath. What's it about? Restoration. Restoration. And it's the, the work that God wants to do. I think when he was speaking to the Israelites here through Ezekiel, he was saying, I want to do this in your country. I want to do this for your nation. This is what I want to do. God is in the business of restoration. And we need this. There are broken down places in our lives, right? There are broken down places in our homes, in our communities that need the restoration of God. And when, when he does this um, in us, then we, people benefit, people around us benefit. Any other thoughts that you had during the last 20, 30 minutes that you'd like to share?
through you. Yeah. 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 That's so good. Um, Jeff, the real Jeff, um, <laughs> pointed out to me this morning that, can you say that again? We're not really dealing with the behaviors. Or, right. I mean, you can change behavior, but until you change the beliefs that are behind those behaviors and the values that are behind the beliefs, you won't see lasting change. What do you value? Yeah. Yeah. So this is getting us back to, because I can, I can shoot at um, behaviors, you know, overloaded life, um, the, the, maybe the guilt that we feel or, um, you know, Netflix or video games or all these things that may distract us and say, you know, stop doing that or stop doing that, um, do this instead. But really it gets down underneath it to, um, what is, what is our, relationship with Jesus? What does that look like? And is that anything that would draw the nation to a holy God? And getting to the, I don't want to just shoot at the fruit. I want to shoot at the root. And the root issue is this. And what it, do we have a desire to be alone with Jesus? Is that within us? Anything else that God did for you in the last, or showed you that you hadn't seen before in the last 20 minutes? I thought the rain was very appropriate <laughs> for the beginning. I always put the clean water on you. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Good, yeah. Yes. My son yesterday, uh, he started summer running for cross country and they went out and I was driving home and called Ann and she said, oh, I think Isaiah's getting poured on. And I said, oh, they'll go under the pavilion at the park that they run at. And I get home and his clothes were there by the door all soaked. And I said, did you get out of the rain? He goes, nope, we ran in it and did all their exercises and sit-ups and everything in the rain. And he said it was so fun. You know, it was a hot day and it was just refreshing. And, you know, when's the last time we were in the rain? and physically felt God's reign. That's a good thing. Jared, would you come up here for a second? I need some help passing these out. And I also want you to see the highest form of flattery is um, <laughs> copying. And so um, this guy... <laughs> has chosen to, uh, I don't know if anybody wants a picture, but um, he's chosen to, yeah. will you pass those out, please? Yeah. All right. <laughs> the Lumberjack story, I shared this, I think, with the administrative team. This is one of my favorites to share. We're, this is what he's passing out now. You may need some help passing those out so we can get those around. Um, as you get this, um, read it, and then we'll talk about it. Should be plenty. If you don't get one, raise your hand and my twin will help you.
Okay, I see most of you have gotten through this. What did you notice? What stood out to you? Hard work is not the key. Okay. It's a piece of it, right? He was certainly working hard, but it's there was somebody working a lot harder, right? What else? Say it again. Pacing. Pacing. Okay. You see the idea of pacing. We'll talk about that in a minute. What else did you notice? Yeah, how many were su a little surprised? You didn't see it coming, the end, that he was, that that's what he was really doing. Yeah. He was resting to sharpen his tools. He was resting to sharpen his tools. It's, a, it's uh, Stephen Covey, if you've read The Seven Habits, is the sharpen the saw. Sometimes you have to shut the machine off to keep it working well. You have to maintain it. You have to sharpen the blade. You have to, uh, if anybody's worked with a chainsaw, uh, you can't, keep going all day. Um, it need, you have to stop, you have to put oil in, you have to put gas in, you have to um, sharpen it. You have to put a new blade on. Otherwise, uh, you can work all day and not get very far. You can work very, very, very hard. And the effectiveness goes down, 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 down. Um, what else did you see? Okay, frustration, tried stepping up his pace, right? Working harder. Uh, yeah, I said they were, they were both committed from the very, Yeah. Just the approach. Okay, both very committed, both very dedicated. Both determined to do the best they could. There was, um, it was just a different approach. One more question. What do you notice about, um, somebody said pacing. Who said that? Something about pace. What if, would, would the result have been the same for Carl if he had taken, let's say, a two hour break at noon and that was it and put all of his rest time in one big chunk in the middle of the day. Do you think he would have had the same result? What do we do? So let's apply that to us. How does that apply to us? How does anything in here, especially that last point, how does that apply to how we sometimes think about rest? But we do that, right? I'm going to push through. I'm going to not rest until this future date when this big vacation is coming, right? And we push all of the rest to the end of something, right? And we're always looking forward to the next week off or two weeks or big thing, you know, <coughs> where I'm going to be able to take this big break and then I can stop and get all of my rest. Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't know that you were here yesterday when we kind of laid the foundation for this. Yes, we promote the hard worker in our homes, in our churches, the Puritan work ethic. We, we love the guy that's working hard, and we promote that. And the guy who stops to rest, we talked about idle hands or the devil's workshop and all these phrases that we have as part of our lingo where rest is devalued and we don't see the value of stopping on a rhythm, a, a pacing ourselves 
so that we can work and run hard and long and be more effective. He was twice as effective because he had a rhythm of rest. But we don't, we don't elevate that. And so that's what I, my challenge to WGM is, to the WGM family, is can we begin to create a new culture where we say, we are going to elevate, we're not gonna devalue the work, the work still has to be done. There's an urgency to the work, but we're gonna elevate the rhythm and the pacing and the saw sharpening that we're doing personally, collectively, so that we can do this for a long time. Um, uh, where's my guy that told me about Mother Teresa? Yes, M Mark, right? Frank. Frank, can I call you Mark? Okay. <laughs> um, so Mark was telling me, tell me what you um, said about Mother Teresa's organization uh, even though she's gone, what have, what have they done to incorporate this idea into their structure? In some of the meeting, I found that Mother Teresa's organization, the only organization so far that doesn't experience burnout, they asked her why, and they said Genesis 1. And, and, she, and they said, what do you mean Genesis 1? And she said, six, six, the 6-1 six formula. And they said, explain it. And she said this. Uh, all of our people work six So I'll let you I'll let you fight that battle with your uh, leadership, um, but it's it's an interesting idea, you know. And how many of you, as missionaries, we've we've spent a lot of time on the field with different missionary families that talk about the hesitancy that they have to maybe take a take a break or take a vacation or take a little trip with their family because, or even, or post those things because they know that there are donors back here saying, oh, I saw you were at the beach. You know, are you, are you're a missionary? Are you, are you allowed to be at the beach? Are you allowed to do fun things with your family? And um, that there's this guilt or this pressure to um, not on a regular basis and periodically step out and sharpen your saw and um, do these things. So let's talk about what that looks like when you, um, you know, he, he wasn't just sitting there on that stump. He was doing something restorative uh, that allowed him to work more effectively. A new definition of rest, here's what it's not. Sometimes we begin defining things by what they are not. It's not vacation necessarily not leisure, not vegging out. This is a big temptation. I'm so exhausted, I'm just going to turn on the TV. I'm just going to Netflix. I'm just going to video game because I don't wanna think. I don't want to do anything right now. Um, this is not what we're talking about. There may be space for that, and this may be, that may be a part of your natural rhythm or part of your habits. Um, I'm not gonna, necessarily say if any of that is right or wrong. I, I, I feel sometimes drawn to that as well, but that's not what we're talking about here. If that is all that you're doing for rest, it's not rest. It's not the rest that God designed. Because oftentimes if you've, uh, even YouTube, um, YouTube can be a vortex of, um, you know, you, you get a video. I was listening to a podcast uh, yesterday on the way home and um, they were saying with the algorithms, the next up video, it used to be, do you remember the days, back in the days, the old days of YouTube where you had to click on a video for the next one to show? Now it comes up, right? It is determining what you want to see next. There's incredible algorithms that are saying you, you liked this video or you chose this video, now we're gonna give you the next in line. And if you allow that one, it continues to allow or um, 
steer your line of thinking and an hour later you realize, wait a minute, what have I done? I just lost an hour of my life um, watching cats chase lasers. Um, <laughs> I've never done that, but um, my kids do. Um, so we're not talking about that, okay? We're not talking it's, uh, or amusing or distracting or numbing types of rest, not drug or medication induced, not laziness, not sedentary or somber. Sometimes we have this idea that, that, this, that um, the Sabbath or rest is, is punishment. Um, and it, I think it comes from our childhood, right? Kids, you know, take a nap. Oh, um, now I know why my parents had us take naps um, on a regular basis, but um, it's not a punishment. Rest, and it, it might be for you, uh, my dad never naps. Um, he just has tons of energy and, and um, oh, Lisa Fish was saying she can't even sit in the seat because she needs to walk around and some of you like sitting here is driving you crazy. Like this is the longest you've sat for a long time. Um, it doesn't have to be sedentary. It doesn't have to be somber. And I'm just, you know, praying all day. Now there's, I, I would encourage you if you haven't done that to spend a day in prayer. Um, it may terrify you, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, this is what restores your soul. That's the definition of rest. If it's not restoring, if an hour of YouTube is not restoring your soul, it's not rest. It's a distraction. It's something that's numbing you. It's escape. It's leisure. But it's not God's definition of rest if it's not restoring your soul. If it's not making you, like the axe, more effective for ministry and service and relationship with him, it's not rest. We are drawn to it, but it's not rest. Would you agree with me? Okay, it's kind of hard. I hope I'm not stepping on too many toes much. Say it. Say it. I want to know what you were thinking. No, we have to know ourselves. What is it that fills us with the story? Yes. This goes back to um, what you were talking about with personality yesterday. Um, so much of this is how you were wired. So what restores me is going to be different than what restores Alice. Um, I, there are things that restore my soul. And there are things that deplete my energy and my soul. I, I, my kids could not wait to be done with school this year. That restores their soul, being done with school. So they're home for, for school for summer break. I, we were both counting down the days. Let me just say this. I love now working from home. And I am so restored by silence. So I work all day. It's me and the dog and the cat. And um, it's silent. And, and people have asked me, you know, do you have the radio on? Do you have music on? No, I, I'm, I am restored. I am energized by silence. Um, I enjoy this. This is good. This fills me up too. But um, having the kids home and the, just the constant noise and... and joy that they bring to my life. Um, it, does not, it does not restore my soul. I need silence. I need space. Um, and that's where, for me, uh, uh, biking gives me some of that. And, um, and when I go for several days without that, I find myself needing that refreshing. So let's, let's just, I want to just hear from you. What restores your soul? What refreshes you? What are some things that re... Yeah. <laughs> somebody, I heard somebody, I heard somebody say um, uh, something like chocolate tastes better than what skinny feels or something like that, <laughs> than what skinny feels like or something. Okay. What else? What restores you? What music. music? 